All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Just a reminder, please rate and review the show. Notice that uh, the ratings have gone down in terms of numbers lately. I feel like our quality, as evidenced by today's guest, has gone up. So let's get like, give us a rating at iTunes. Happy to welcome today's guest, Steve Kornacki. He's a national political correspondent for NBC News and MSNBC. Steve Kornacki, welcome back to the news. Thanks, and uh, now I know I got to go do the uh, the like button when I finish here. I'll make sure to I'll make sure to listen to your uh, your advice. No, you know what? I need to be better at that. I, there there are tons of podcasts that I listen to, and I've been delinquent, and I will I will do the same and go and rate and review uh, podcast. So, uh, thank you. Hold myself accountable. Um, let's go, let's go broad. Just, uh, tell us takeaways from Iowa and, uh, heading into New Hampshire. What's on your mind? What are you seeing? I mean, honestly, I think we saw, or at least I saw in Iowa pretty much exactly what, what, you know, was expected. Um, one note I would make is, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, bashing of polls these days. And, and then, you know, polls have had their issues in the last few years. But I think it's also, you know, a, a reminder that polling is not dead. The uh, the Des Moines Register poll, which is really well regarded and which we at NBC were fortunate enough to partner with this year, um, pretty much nailed it. Um, you know, we, we did in our final poll have Haley ahead of DeSantis. But uh, in that poll were all sorts of indications that her support was soft relative to DeSantis's and that in a lower turnout environment, maybe affected by the weather there, DeSantis seemed in position to potentially catch it for second, which is exactly what ended up happening. Um, so I, I, I think it was a win for the for the polling industry. Um, it was obviously a, a, a win for Trump, which, you know, in, in the over the course of the last last six months, you know, nine months or so is not a surprise. I think if you had told me, you know, at this time last year, 2023, coming off the 2022 midterms, coming off DeSantis' 60 percent, um, you know, that he got in Florida in his reelection campaign. Um, if you had told me that, you know, Trump was going to beat DeSantis by 30 in Iowa and get an outright majority of the vote. At that point, I would have been very surprised, but not the way things have, have unfolded in 2023. And we'll see what happens in New Hampshire. But I think, you know, we saw, you know, what Haley got in Iowa is what the polls have been showing. She does well with upper income. She does well with you know, in the suburbs. She does well with college degrees. She does well with non-Republicans. Um, New Hampshire's a state where that can get you pretty far in a primary, but there aren't many like it. So, um, yeah, it was no seeing where she got her votes from in Iowa. There was also no surprise there to me. And you mentioned if what things looked like a year ago. Um, you know, it's it's impossible to know this, but if Ron DeSantis had gotten in the race like in January instead of the summer, if he had. Uh, you know, aggressively gone after Trump, you know, in a smart way, talking about how Trump was fine, but he's got too much baggage. He's going to be too busy. He's going to lose to Joe Biden again, by the way, he lost last time. Um, and in the the first indictment, obviously, I think was a uh, uh, that's that's when the race got out of out of control, uh, when when Trump went up big time in the polls. Uh, if, if DeSantis had handled that a little bit differently, maybe attacked him a little more instead of I mean, do you think there's a scenario where uh, DeSantis could have given Trump a run for his money? Or was this just like the Republican Party likes Trump? Trump's in the race. Therefore, Trump is the nominee. I pretty much think it's that. It's the second. But I, I, I agree. Um, I'm not as sure if, if you could somehow redo 2023 and take the indictments out. I'm not as sure because the polling in late 22 and early 23 before the indictments showed DeSantis. There were polls that had DeSantis ahead of Trump. Um, you know, the average, you know, in, in early 23 was Trump single digits over DeSantis. So, you know, now we've had so many false starts over the last eight or nine years where it looks like Republican voters are suddenly going to are, you know, reaching their breaking point with Trump and moving away only to snap back and and be as loyal to him as ever. So it's possible to me that was inevitable too, even without the indictments. But the indictments, it seems, certainly did it. You're you're right. Um, we have a, a graphic we've been using on air this week that just shows the poll average going back to late 22, and it's that it's basically the week that the Manhattan DA comes out with the Stormy Daniels case, and the you know Trump's line just shoots up, and it and it just rallied Republicans around him, 
And I, you know, I think from that point on, no, I, I, I really don't. I think the DeSantis campaign was premised on the. It was essential to the DeSantis campaign that Republican voters be ready to move on from Trump, and they were certainly indications of that. You know, in early twenty three. And, you know, the Santa strategy would be a soft one. You wouldn't have to go after Trump hard. You could be respectful you know, to him and Republican voters would just come to you because, you know, they kind of got it. That was really, I think, the premise. And that was inoperative after after the indictments. And then he's living in a world where, you know, again, I, I've yet to see a Republican successfully figure out the way to go after Trump in a way that... <laughs> Um, keeps you in the good graces of Republicans because um, you just you know look Pence, Christie, Asa Hutchinson in this race they were the only three Republicans consistently with negative ratings among Republicans and they were huge negative ratings they were the three that went after Trump and you know we go back to Corker we could go back to Flake and I just I see that pattern so yeah I don't I just don't see what what the Sanders could have really done after the um, after the indictments and and he found himself in this trap of of just like did not want to alienate those voters. And, and that meant, how do you make a case for yourself relative to Trump? I feel like Nikki Haley is in this similar trap. Um, I was thinking about, so, you know, Donald Trump is, for all practical purposes, an incumbent. He obviously has the establishment behind him. And yet Nikki Haley is the one who's running like she's up by two touchdowns. She's like playing a prevent defense, trying to run out the clock. I was saying, you know, well, and Pat Buchanan's obviously a populist, uh, n- not not my philosophical cup of tea, but I've always liked Pat, and I and I thought that he ran that uh, he ran with, uh, you know, it was poetry almost. You know, it, it, I liked the way that he campaigned, and I was thinking he, I think he would have taken it to Donald Trump. You know that interview where where Dana Bash uh, says. You know, Trump's like on trial or, you know, for being found liable for sexual assault. Um, and you're the only woman in the race. Nikki Haley, how, how do you handle that? And she's like, well, I haven't really been following the race closely and I'm not a lawyer. And, I'm like, well, and you're not going to be president either. Um, long wind up here. But like it, it feels like Nikki is uh, is she running for vice president? Is she just trying to balance like. Uh, not offending Trump voters. W- what's her deal? Yeah, I, I think she's just aware of those same tripwires where it's just like, you know, if you if you say something negative about Trump, uh, the, the Republicans who like Trump, and that is the vast majority of Republicans, start to turn on you. And I think she's mindful of that. And, and the, I think the thing with Haley is even as mindful of it as she has has been, evident in her in the way she campaigns, um, it's kind of happening anyway because. Trump voters, Republicans who like Trump are seeing that Haley's drawing this support from Democrats, from independents, from non-Republicans. Our poll in Iowa showed that exactly half of her support came from Democrats and independents. Our final poll in Iowa found that 77 percent of Haley's supporters said they didn't like Donald Trump. And I think just getting identified with that, getting identified as being the vehicle for the anti-Trump voters, even if you yourself are not out there relentlessly bashing him the way Christie did, I think I think Republicans figure it out quickly and they start. And we saw it in, in our final Iowa poll. Haley, in the final four weeks of that Iowa campaign, her negative rating among Republicans had shot up 15 points. No one no one else's had done that. Her favorable had come come down from 59 to 48. And I, I think a, there was a lot of negative advertising going on out there. But, you know, again, she kind of stands alone in that category. And I think that was just pro Trump Republicans kind of you know, making her out as a, um, you know, taking her for the the, the anti-Trump candidate and saying, no, we don't like you. And I, I think she's up against that. I wonder if it's like a, a tautology or a catch-22. If you run against Trump, you will have betrayed the Republican Party. Therefore, you are a sellout by virtue, simply by virtue of running against Trump. You are not worthy to be like that. That's all we need to know about you is that you're running and you're not Trump. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I will say DeSantis managed uh, he you know, not much support, but he still has a strong favorable rating with Republicans. So the Trump voters still like DeSantis. That's pretty clear in the polling. They just they just prefer Trump. And yeah, again, it's like the 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 this is where the Republican electorate has been, you know, for almost a decade now. 
And no one has figured, as I say, just no one in the Republican side has figured out how you go up against him when he's strong. So really, the only opening that was ever here in 24 on the Republican side was if Republican voters had changed their mind somehow and were willing to, you know, back away and reconsider their loyalty and, and you know, kind of write him off. And I, again, like, I think that was the all these candidates. I think that's what they were thinking when they got in the race, that that was finally happening because of the 2022 midterms maybe because of, you know, lingering January 6th stuff that had affected the 2022 midterms, all of that. And, you know, without the indictments, we'll never know. Maybe it, maybe that really would have happened. But again, once those indictments came down, I think Republicans just took it as, you know, uh, look, you know, they, they being the Democrats, Democratic prosecutors, the media, they're, they're stopping at nothing still to go after Trump. And they feel a sense of loyalty there because, you know, he's kind of being attacked by politically all the right people. Um, I feel like this, when the spell's broken, it's temporary. It's very quick. If you could help call it a snap election last December or impeached him on January 7th and, you know, and convicted him on January 8th or something like that, that's your only shot. It's to take him down and, you know, very quickly. But I mean, this, you know, once again, this whole thing about like, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. I mean, the idea that, in, that indicting somebody helps them. <laughs> Like if you're all, if you, if you have an audience where if a candidate's indicted, they get more popular, that audience may just really like that, that candidate. And I think the, I also think they feel, you know, um, there's something to the idea of they, they, I, my sense of it is they're, they're not really looking at all 91 of these indictments and this one says this and this one says that they're they're kind of taking it in one lump sum and saying this is um this is democrats this is our these are our political enemies turning to their lawyers and trying to do what they're afraid they can't do at the ballot box and it's not just that they, and then it becomes a thing i think psychologically where it's like it's not just that they are afraid they can't stop trump it's the, to the voter, the Republican voter becomes, they're afraid they can't stop us. They're trying to stop us, not by beating us in an election, but by getting the right lawyers to come up with the right, you know, creative, you know, uh, uh, case to use against him and to get a ruling. And I, I you know, I think that, I, I think, you know, that taps into something pretty powerful too, that then brings them around to saying, you know, we got to stand with Trump because, you know, that's standing up for ourselves. Definitely. What do you think about Nikki deciding not to debate? I would have gotten it if she had come in second in Iowa and coming into New Hampshire with a lot of momentum. Um, I could see like I'm not going to debate Ron DeSantis anymore. He's done. But as it stands, I think that she probably deprived herself. And Mike Murphy, by the way, is out with a sub stack on this. I think he's right. I think she's deprived herself of some publicity that and, and, and maybe even offended some granite staters. And then the, the other weird thing is if she had debated DeSantis, helping DeSantis arguably helps her because mm -hmm. DeSantis takes vote from Trump, votes from Trump. What do you think of that decision? Yeah, I, I, I kind of think she, it, it, it might not have been politically wise either from the standpoint of this. Um, the New Hampshire electorate is unusually engaged, like the a high level of political engagement in New Hampshire, you really don't see in almost any other state. The turnout level for these primaries is absolutely astronomical. They're so used to it's part, it's just ingrained into the culture in New Hampshire. So it's not, you know, we just come out of Iowa where 110,000 people participated in these caucuses. Now you go to New Hampshire, which is like half the size, and there's probably going to be 300,000 people voting in this, in this primary. So it's that level of interest. And they pay close attention to New Hampshire. It's not, it's not just a cliche. It's true. And so if you throw a debate on WMUR, which is the one broadcast affiliate in New Hampshire, goes statewide, Channel 9, you throw a debate on their airwaves in prime time in the closing days of the campaign, and it's Haley versus DeSantis and Trump is skipping it. I, I, I think she, that there's an upside there that didn't exist as much in Iowa. And I, she, I think she got a lot out of those debates to begin with, because it's why she was kind of able to emerge from the pack and at least be in the position she's in now. But I think if her goal is to win New Hampshire, and I, I, I see no world where she can have any kind of a shot at this without winning New Hampshire, and, and she's running from behind there, um, that's, a great, that's a great opportunity for her in my mind. I mean, there's obviously a risk in debating, 
But, you know, look, DeSantis is not registering in New Hampshire right now in the polls. He doesn't have really any organization there. Um, and I, 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 the risk of like elevating him, I, I, I think, you know, voters in New Hampshire have kind of figured out this is a Haley versus Trump decision. And that, yeah, I think that was a chance for her to really make an impression on them that, that could have moved some voters. Again, just given the, the voters in particular I have in mind are not Republicans, they're independents. And they, they just create a variable in New Hampshire that doesn't exist in any other state. And there, were, there was a chance, I think, for her to get some independence. Uh, going back to something you said earlier, uh, it sounds like DeSantis has not completely destroyed his brand in the Republican Party, that it's still possible that he could come back in the future based on what you're seeing. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's what it looks like, you know, and I mean, if, if Trump wins, you know, wins the presidency, you know, he's term limited out. It'd be one term. If he loses, you know, I don't want to completely write it off. He'll be 82 in 2028. 20, uh, but, you know, look, he's he's defied all conventional wisdom so far. There is probably a world where maybe a world where even at 82, he could still win the nomination after losing twice. I don't completely discount that. But short of that, yeah, 28 is going to be sitting there wide open. Um, and so DeSantis, I, you know, I could go back to Florida, um, probably make some more headlines that are, you know, a favor appealing to, you know, to conservatives around the country. And um, I, I, I look at his poll numbers right now and I say, that's somebody who would be viable and, and probably have a pretty big leg up in a, uh, in a future, you know, Republican race. Now you could look at his performance in the campaign trail and you could, you know, there's a lot of criticism of that. And, you know, did he show that, you know, uh, he doesn't wear well. And I mean, that's a that's a question too. be totally different field running against him. But yeah, I mean, he's you know, he's exited. I say exit. He's still in the race. But, you know, if he does exit the race shortly, I, it looks like he'll do so with with a lot of fans still on the Republican side. What are you looking for on Tuesday? Like if such and such, if Trump wins this precinct, it's all over. Or if Nikki wins that county, uh, what are a couple things that you might be keeping an eye out for? Yeah, I, I mean, it's I was trying to think what a good, you know, kind of bellwether is a, a, a big, obvious one is the second largest city in the state. It's Nashua. But, it, you know, if you look back at the 2016, you know, primary, the Nashua result almost perfectly mirrors the statewide result. So, I mean, that's that's one to look at. There are some smaller. Towns. It's interesting in New Hampshire. You know, it's it's different than in New England. It's different than a lot of other states. They report it out by city and town directly. So in a lot of states, the cities and towns report to the county, then the county reports out its results. So when we're tracking results on election night here, we're going to have a map with hundreds of cities and towns on it, and they're going to we're going to be getting individual um, results from them. So there's you know like there's a town called Milford um, in southern New Hampshire. It's a little bit west of Nashua and uh, Manchester, kind of between the two. Um, it's it's another good bellwether. Goffstown, which is a suburb of of Manchester, I'd look at that one. There's some like that. Um, a real interesting one that I'm going to be I'm very curious about and I'll be hyping on the air is Salem, New Hampshire, which is, is right off I-93, right across the Massachusetts border. But the Sununu family is like this is their this is where they're from. You know, this is like political Republican political loyalty in New Hampshire. I mean, there's the current governor, Chris Sununu. There's his brother who used to be a senator and a congressman. There's his father, who was the governor in the 1980s, who was Bush 41's chief of staff. And the family is from. Salem and but and of course Kristen Noon is backing Haley, but at the same time Salem was one of Donald Trump's best towns in New Hampshire in 2016. He got 48 percent of the vote there, so it's an interesting clash between Trump and the Sununus who are on opposite sides of this. And I'm very curious how that one's gonna how that one's gonna shake out. Who do you like in the playoffs this weekend? <laughs> you know, I've I, so I'm a I'm a Patriots fan, so I got I got nothing left. I've I've been out of this you know since the fall. I like the lion. I just the lions are an underdog. I like I like good a good story. underdog story, you know. How about how about the Buffalo Bills? That's a good story. Yeah, it is. It is. I you know I don't know. Maybe it's because they're an AFC East rival. I don't. I don't quite. <laughs> I don't quite feel it as much. I wouldn't call but, them you know. a rival though, because for twenty years you guys destroyed them, uh, and now they will destroy you. <laughs> well, see, I, this is where I, my age shows. I'm still licking wounds from the eighties and nineties, and oh. you know. <laughs> I'm remembering like the Parcells Pete Carroll era when it was the Pats and the Bills and it was a, you know, they, they were the team you always had to knock off to, to get the division. Um, well, I tell you what, the Pats had a heck of a run um, and yeah, maybe they'll turn the corner now post Belichick. So we, uh, yeah, well, <laughs>
<laughs> final uh, final thoughts. I uh, appreciate you taking time, obviously, during this busy time. Final thoughts for us as we're uh, trying to make sense of this crazy election year. Uh, could be general election, could be primary, or anything you want to plug. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I just, I think we're, we could be in a really kind of unprecedented situation after next Tuesday. We've never seen um, a Republican candidate, a non-incumbent Republican, win both Iowa and New Hampshire. You know, they're, they're, they've always had a split verdict. It's always kept the race going after New Hampshire. But, um, you know, if Trump wins, and if Trump wins big, you know, I'd, I'd say like 15 points or so in New Hampshire, coming you off think of 30... You think that is a plausible scenario? I think it's, it's definitely possible. It, it all hinges on the independents. You know, how many of them participate and how they're going to, I think they're going to go for Haley. The question is, how big are they going to go for Haley? So I, I kind of exist in a world where the range of outcomes here is like Haley by two points on one extreme and Trump by 20 on the other extreme. And I, I think it's going to land somewhere in there. I know that's a really bold statement, but um if it's if it's towards that twenty point end of things, um, I you know if you're Haley, you've now lost the state you had the best chance to win in by a pretty wide margin, and then you're looking at going to your home state where you're pulling much worse than you are in New Hampshire, and you're facing I'd say at that point certain defeat, not just defeat, landslide defeat. I don't know how you could go on in the face of that. And if you're DeSantis, you're running out of money, you know. And, and Trump now, after a double digit win in New Hampshire, I mean, if you think he looks inevitable now and the endorsements are rolling in now, imagine that world. And DeSantis is going to, you know, maybe he'd try in South Carolina to make a stand, but I think he'd be looking at like a 50 point loss there. Um, and I think that's where, you know, you're talking about long term with DeSantis. He does at some point have to start thinking about that. You know, if he if he leaves early um, and, and kind of gracefully, the damage is probably limited. But if he starts losing in in you know 50 point you know landslides and, and trump starts saying what the heck are you doing in this race and really going after him hard yeah i know trump's been going after him hard but i mean he could really turn it on um you know that could that could jeopardize you know the goodwill that desantis currently still has with republicans i intentionally didn't ask you for a prediction because i know new hampshire is so hard to predict i remember you know mccain and 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 uh, uh hillary clinton and i just that one's tough, right? And there, am I right? There's not that much, po not as much polling there either. Yeah, and that's a general thing. People have pulled back from polling for a variety of reasons, cost, and everybody gets scared of having the bad poll now. But I, you're right. I, I think the the thing in New Hampshire is just the um, again, it's the it's the presence of independents. I mean, they're going to make up forty five percent of this Republican primary electorate. That's a number you 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 just don't see anywhere else. It could be even higher than that. Um, and so it really is like. If the independent number is 45 percent or higher and Haley's winning it by a big enough margin, could it could off, she's going to lose the, the core Republican vote, but it could offset that. It can't in most there are very few states could it possibly do that. But in New Hampshire, it could. So it, I think that's just that's the variable. And, um, you know, one thing she's helped by is the Democratic primary is there's a little bit of one that the Biden right in. There's no delegates. And, but I think most independents who decide to vote on Tuesday in New Hampshire, the vast majority will take Republican ballots. So. And that's what that's what she's counting on. So that's why I think there's a there's a bigger range. When we got to the finish line in Iowa, I didn't see much of a range of possible outcomes. But I, I, I right from this vantage point a few days out, I do in New Hampshire. Well, this thing could be over in a couple of days. And I just say from a personal standpoint, um, bad news for me, because <laughs> this is what I'm, you know, not nearly yeah. as in demand as you are, but I'm kind of in demand in a Republican primary. And if this thing's over, uh, at least I'm not a super PAC, you know, raising and imagine <laughs> those guys are really going to lose money. Uh, but, uh, so maybe, maybe Nikki will, I mean, I guess if, if Nikki wins and certainly wins convincingly, then we get a month of, of talk. We, every, we all, we all just moved to South Carolina, right? right? Exactly. Yep. And it's, yeah. And it's, then it's, you know, she has to, she'd have to win her home state, which in, you know, past times wouldn't have been hard for a candidate, but in, in, in the environment we're in now, it would be hard for her. And she'd have to win South Carolina. She'd have to appeal to voters. She didn't get in Iowa. And even if she wins New Hampshire, I don't think she's getting the type of voter in New Hampshire that exists in much larger numbers in South Carolina that she would need to get. But yeah, it'd be a month. It would be a month of that. And um, uh, Trump would he would crank it up against her. And um, it, it, it'd be interesting 
you know, it'd be interesting to watch. But she'd have to parlay a New Hampshire win, in my view, into a South Carolina win. There's no close second for her in her home state. Um, I, if you can't win your home state, um, I, I can't see how she starts winning Tennessee and Texas and all that. It just, I, it just, it's not there. She'd have to win her home state. But I think I, I just, I struggle to see a DeSantis scenario. Um, I struggle to see a Haley scenario, but I, I could at least start to patch one out for her, and that would be what it is. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to put zero on anybody. I've, that's the safest thing in punditry. Always put the odds between 0.1 and 99.9, and you can always say you left room for, for the other outcome. Amen. Good advice. Always a pleasure. Steve Kornacki, thank you for coming back on the news. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Always fun.